Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to everyone out there. Uh, it really is uh, so good to have all of you with us as today we are going to be concluding uh, the series that we've been in for the last couple months called Dave. Let me hear you say Dave. Dave. Dave, David, King David, whatever you want to call him from the Old Testament, he's a conundrum to preach. Uh, and the reason why is because we literally have so much content around this guy's life, things he said and did, um, that I, I could have made this series an entire year if I wanted, right? So um, we didn't feel that was probably the best way to spend our year. Uh, so r right now, it's, we're, we're condensing. So really, this series, we've just been parachuting kind of down into the highlight reel of David's life. Uh, so far, we've seen him at a very young age anointed to be the next king of Israel. We've seen him uh, charge the battlefield when all of the Israelite armies were afraid. He's the one who charged out and killed Goliath. Uh, we've seen him show great restraint when Saul repeatedly was trying to kill him. And even though there was moments when he could have uh, ended Saul's life, he didn't. We've seen him crowned king, and he's a merciful king, a kind king, as he takes care of Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son. Uh, we've seen, and those are like a lot of the good moments. Uh, last week, we saw him in a really, really bad moment. We've seen him murder. We've seen him as an adulterer. We've seen him as a liar. And in the middle of that, we've also seen God's grace and forgiveness. Anybody just want to say amen to God's grace and forgiveness? And today, as we close off this series, we're not really going to be looking at a story of David, but rather what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of his very last words as he was passing the mantle to his son, Solomon. So if you have a Bible, why don't you turn with me this morning to 1 Kings chapter 2. At this point, we're going to Roll the tape forward from last week, 20 more years. Uh, David was 50 when the whole Bathsheba incident went down. Now David is 70 years old and he's about to die. And, and as he kind of is realizing his age and stage of life, the, the particular circumstance around him, the, the, the next big job that he has, maybe the last big job that he has, is passing the mantle to the next king of Israel, who is going to be his son, Solomon. So here's, a, well, l l let me just ask the question. So like, it's, it's Father's Day. Even right now, dads in the room, online, I, I want you to think about this for a moment. If you knew that you were going to die, and you had one last conversation with your children, what would you say? Like, just think about that for a moment. If you had one last moment to kind of lay out what the most important things were to you, what would that be? Well, right here in what we're about to read is part of, not the whole picture, but part of some of David's very last words to his son Solomon. The things that kind of meant the most to him in his dying days. Here it is, 1 Kings chapter 2, we'll pick it up in verse 1. It says, as the time of King's, King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. He said, I'm going where everyone on earth must someday go. Take courage and be a man. <laughs> I love that. You know, I've just decided in this moment, I'm, uh, moment, I'm going to name my sermon right now, Be a Man. Okay? That's, that's, that's fitting for Father's Day, okay? Be a man. Isn't it interesting? Like, all around the world in different cultural groups, settings, we all have these certain things that we think actually, like, it, it's what a man's supposed to be, right? In, in certain circles, being a man is having many women, right? In certain circles, being a man is having a lot of money or a lot of prestige or, or a lot of power, right? Being a man is being able to beat up all the other men, <laughs> you know? This is just stuff, right? That, again, this is not Bible, this is culture. But you know, what's, what's interesting, I'm actually not all that concerned in what our shifting culture thinks what being a man is. What I want to know is what does the Bible say about being a man? 
David here, take courage and be a man. I love right before that, he says, listen, Solomon, I'm going to the place where everybody on earth must someday go. What's he talking about? Death, the grave. I actually did some study this week. According to a recent study, one out of every one people die. Be blessed. <laughs> it's true. And, you know, I, I don't mean to treat this flippantly, because, but the reality is it, it's actually the Bible that points this out repeatedly. It's First Peter that says, for all people are like grass, and the grass withers. Uh, James 4 says, what is your life? We're a mist that appears. You're here one moment, you're gone the next. Or 2 Samuel 14 just bluntly says it, we must all die. We are like water spilled on the ground. You ever spill water like on soil? It's like you see it for a moment, it's there, it's gone. And like the Bible's painting all these different pictures to illustrate one point, that this life that we're in right now, although might feel long in the moment, in the light of eternity, this is a blip on the radar. We must all die unless Jesus comes back. And let me just be very clear. He might. Like, he could come back before I end this sermon, and you would all be spared from what I have to say. But if he doesn't, first of all, you're going to have to finish the sermon, and we must die, right? And unless he comes back, our organs will fail, our heart will stop beating, our bodies will go into the ground and turn to dust. But now, before we slip into like a negative depression, let me, let me rescue you for a moment, okay? Um, for, 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 for God's people, death is not the end, okay? Like we do not need to fear death at all. Be there is life after death. And if Jesus actually rose from the grave, then so will we. We are promised eternity with God forever in new resurrected bodies on a new resurrected earth. This is the good news. But for a lot of people, death is inevitable. It is part of the story unless Jesus comes back. David knows this. He pulls in his son Solomon and says, I'm going to the place where everybody on earth must someday go and then he's going to give his charge, take courage and be a man. And then here it is, verse 3 and 4. This is our main text today. Here's what being a man looks like. And women in the room, first of all, pay attention as well. This applies, okay? But men this morning, listen. It says, observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commands, regulations, and laws written in the law of Moses so that you will be successful in all that you do and wherever you go. If you do this, then the Lord will keep the promise that he made to me. He told me, if your descendants live as if they should and follow me faithfully with all their hearts and soul, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. These are the words that David gives, knowing that he's about to die. And it's interesting here, he gives two commands and one promise. And so over the next few minutes, I just want to really briefly look at the two commands that David gives Solomon and then the amazing promise at the end. Here's the, the, the first uh, command in verse 3. He says, observe the requirements of the Lord your God. He's, what was he saying? He's, he's, he's talking about the scriptures. The, the, the first command is to study God's word. Come on, just say, study God's word. <laughs> this is the first command. And he's talking about the scriptures. Now we today uh, have the, the complete um, grouping, collection of scriptures, much more than David even had in this moment when he said this. But, but what's What's cataloged in this book was so important to David in this moment that he tells his son, listen, I'm going to die. Here's what you need to know. You need to study these words. 
You need to understand these words. You need to be in the word. You need to read these words because this is God's word. In the, in the 1700s, there was a French philosopher by the name of Voltaire. One day, Voltaire arrogantly and audaciously proclaimed that this book that I hold in my hands within 100 years would fall out of grace and place with the world around. That within 100 years, that this book in my hands would become irrelevant. People would stop reading it. It would just fade off into the distance. Well, not long after making this statement, Voltaire died. His house was put up for auction. People came from all around the world to place bids on his house. And in a sovereign twist of irony, the people who purchased Voltaire's home was the French Bible Society, (laughs) who promptly moved in and for the next several decades printed off thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Bibles in the very home of the man who said this book would no longer be relevant. (laughs) The moral of the story is simple. Like, there is something special about this book. (laughs) Like, there is, like, think, like, what is it about this book and these words that have made them, like, the best-selling book of all time, hands down? What what is it about this book that, that you can go to many hotels all around the world, open up the nightstand next to the bed, and you will find a copy of this book? What, what, what is it about this book that try as you may, you cannot make it go away? What is it about this book? The answer is, well, this is God's book. <laughs> I love 2 Timothy 3.16. Paul says, all scripture is God breathed. Those words, God breathed, that's a Greek compound word, theos noustos. Theos is God. Noustos carries the idea of breath. Uh, what, what he's saying is that, that all, like the Bible that we have, it's God breathed, it's God inspired, it's, it has God's inspirational breath all over it. <laughs> Like, I love C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, but God didn't breathe on that book. I love Tim Keller's The Reason for God. I've, I've read it multiple times, but God didn't breathe on that book. I'm, I'm enjoying right now Heiser's The Unseen Realm, but God didn't breathe on that book. What makes this book, unlike any other book, is that this book was <sighs> breathed on by God inspired by God. Like this is the great exhalation of God. David knows this. So before death, he pulls in his son and says, listen, here is the first command I have for you. Study this book. Be in the book. Read the book. This is God's word. Study it. That's the first thing. And then he goes on from there. He He keeps saying in the passage we just read, and he said, and also keep the decrees, the commands, and the regulations in them. So the first command is to study God's word. The second command is to follow God's word. Let me hear it. Say, follow God's word. word. (sighs) Hmm. It's interesting, right? Um, Most of us in this room would profess to be Christians. Um, Isn't it interesting that sometimes hearing God's word, reading God's word, even memorizing God's word, it's, it's, it's easy to sometimes do that. It's easier to do that than it is to actually follow God's word. Somehow we kind of divorce these things sometimes. Hmm. Let me ask a question, and I want you to respond back out loud. Okay, most of you in this room, you've read your Bibles. You've listened to the sermons. Uh, Yes or no questions. Just answer them back to me out loud. Ready? Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Do you believe he was born of the Virgin Mary? Yes. Do you believe that he lived the perfect life? Yes. Do you believe that he died the sinner's death? Yes. 
Awesome. Do you believe that he rose triumphant over the grave? Do you believe that he ascended into heaven and is one day coming back for us? Awesome. You know who else believes that? The devil. (laughs) And you know, you know why the devil knows that? Not because he's all knowing. He's not. We give the devil sometimes way too much credit. He's not all knowing. He's not God. He knows it because he knows the Bible. He studies the Bible. The question is, what's the difference between you and the devil? Well, hopefully a lot. (laughs) Hopefully. (laughs) But I'll give you one of the big differences between us and the devil. We don't just study God's word. We do what it says. We, we don't read the word to somehow come and to twist it to our own liking or make it something else. No, no, no. We come and we, we surrender to it. We, we let the word of God read us. You know, in the New Testament, James uh, is going to say something very close to what David said here. James, the brother of Jesus, this is chapter 1, 22 to 24. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. He says, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. It's actually kind of terrifying what James said here, that reading the word, studying the word, even memorizing the word, if not applied to your life, man, it's deceiving because it makes you think you're healthy when really you're not. And then to illustrate the point, he uses a mirror, right? He says, think about a mirror. My guess is every single one of us this morning has looked in a mirror, yes? Right? We, we did this because we wanted to make sure that our clothes match, and we wanted to make sure that we had no spinach in our teeth, and we wanted to make sure that our hair was done just right. This is a great concern of mine every day. <laughs> we look in the mirror... Because the mirror is an accurate reflection of what is. Another way of saying it is that the mirror reads us. It exposes things in us that we wouldn't know were there if it wasn't for the mirror. James says, how foolish is it for somebody to look in a mirror, see that he has spinach in his teeth, and not take it out? (laughs) How foolish is it for somebody to read the word, study the word, memorize the word, but not apply it to your life. Not, like, it's deceiving. It's, 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 it's dangerous. Like, listen, it doesn't matter how many times you come in here and you listen to me preach. It, it doesn't really matter, like, how many times you, 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 you memorize the scripture, you even take notes. If the word is not applied it's incredibly deceiving. So David knows this, right? So he turns to his Solomon. These are his two commands to his son. Take courage, be a man. Here's what it looks like. You need to study God's word. You need to understand what it says. Read it, be in it. And then the second thing is that you need to do what it says. This, this is what biblical manhood looks like. This, let me me get over the man thing. Women in the room. This is what being a follower of Jesus looks like. This is what maturity looks like right here. These are the two commands. And then he gives the promise. And I love the promise. It is so, so good. He goes on to say in verse four, he says, if you do this, If you do this, it says, then the Lord will keep the promise that he made to me. He goes on to say, you'll be successful in all that you do. And one of your descendants will always sit on the throne of Israel. I love it. The promise is this. God will be faithful. God will be faithful. And this is an absolutely amazing promise of God. God promises to David, which then gets applied through the bloodline of his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, that as long as they do these two things, 
as long as they're in the word, study the word, they're faithful to God, doing their best to follow him, God says this, I'm going to take care of the rest. I'm going to take care of the rest. Like, it's complicated. There's a lot of other pieces. But he's saying, follow me. Submit to me. Walk with me. And I'm going to take care of the rest. And we may envy this promise that was given to David in his lineage, but the reality is we have almost the exact same promise of God. Jesus, in Matthew 6, said this, but seek first the kingdom of God in all his righteousness. So that's the command. Seek God first and then the promise and all these things will be added to you. He's saying, if you just come to me, if you just surrender to me, saying, I'm gonna take care of the rest. Every anxiety, every fear, every pain, every trouble, every, every, every circumstance that you don't know what to do, I'm going to take care of it. Just make sure that you put me first or, or listen to James 1.25. It says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Parker, would anybody here want to be blessed by God? Like, <laughs> I, just, I just want the blessing of God in my life, okay? I, I, I want to position myself under the waterfall of God's grace so that when he opens up that faucet, I'm there and I'm ready. That's what I want, <laughs> I want the blessing of God here and I want it now. And he says, all right, here's how you get it. You need to walk with me. Be in the word, do what it says. Surrender to me in all my ways. Like, listen, Parkwood, when we gave our lives to Jesus, for some of you, this wasn't long ago. For some of you, this might have been decades ago. But when we gave our lives to Jesus, wherever it was and whatever circumstance led to that, we didn't receive just this like ghetto to hell free card that we place in our back pocket to use on a rainy day. That's, that's not the Christian life. What we do when we said yes to Jesus, it was, this was an act of surrender of us saying, I'm done doing this my own way. Jesus, now I'm doing it your way. I believe it was Bonhoeffer who said that when Christ bids a man, he bids him to come and die. Jesus doesn't say, hey, come to me and keep all this stuff. No, no, no. He says, come to me and die. To all that other stuff in your life that's not me, all that other stuff that you're pursuing in this life that's not me. He says, die. Die to it. And then come and be raised into new life with me. This is the Christian life. This is the Christian walk because it's in the life of surrender, Parkwood, that we truly step into the promises of God. And the promises of God ultimately find all of their meaning and significance for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Can we stand up to our feet? I want to read for you one more passage of scripture. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. The him is Jesus. Okay? Hear me. All the promises of God, all the promises of God find their yes, their fulfillment in Jesus. It goes on to say, that is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Everything that God has ever promised over your life is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Your joy is fulfilled in Jesus. Your peace is fulfilled in Jesus. Your hope is fulfilled in Jesus. Your salvation is fulfilled in Jesus. Your future resurrected body is fulfilled in Jesus. 
Life everlasting is fulfilled in Jesus. All the promises of God find their yes in him. So what we do is we turn and we give our amen. This is the so be it. We are in agreement to God for his glory. Listen to me. I don't know what is going on in your life right now. I don't know what struggle you're in. I don't know what challenge we were praying earlier. This could be mental. This could be physical. This could be financial, emotional, any other word that ends with all. (laughs) But whatever it is, I promise you this. If you have Jesus, you have enough. If you have Jesus, you have everything that you will ever need. Every promise of God is fulfilled in Jesus. Every promise. Every promise is fulfilled in him and in him alone. So David's last words. David's last words could not be more fitting for us today. Take courage and be a man. Study God's word. Understand God's word. Read God's word. Follow it. Do what it says. Do what it says. Live it out. And God says, if you do that, I'm going to take care of the rest. I'm going to take care of the rest. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to comfort you. I'm gonna surround you. You will never be alone ever again in your life. I'm your God, you're my child. And we know this promise to be true because we have Jesus. All the promises of God find their yes in him. So we now turn, church, and we give God glory. So maybe this morning, it's been a long time since you've given God glory. Maybe you find yourself in a situation this morning, you're so hurt and devastated, you feel numb on the inside. And I'm gonna call you this morning to give God glory. In the good season that you're in, turn and give God glory. In the midnight of your soul, turn and give God glory. All the promises of God find their yes in him. God is our good, good father. (laughs) He loves us tremendously. And so we turn and we worship him with everything that we have. He is faithful.